We're Compound Everything. We talk money, markets, and investing. And today we are talking about Airbnb. If you can like and subscribe this video uh, before we get going, that really helps. And I think we're just gonna say we're doing a very shallow dive into a very deep pool. Hopefully you find this useful. Hopefully it whets your appetite to go and learn more about Airbnb or any other company for that matter, really. Exactly. But hopefully you find our video useful and use that as a logic point. So what brought Airbnb into our attention or why did we decide to do a more uh, more thorough dive than what we've done in the past? Like how did this all come about? So investing for me is a little like fishing. I like to go and fish at the 52 week low mm -hmm. area of the stock market. Maybe yeah. that hasn't turned out well sometimes, but most of the time I think it's actually good fishing grounds. And Airbnb is actually making 52 week lows. Well, mm -hmm. at least it was recently. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how it got back on my radar. It's been my radar watch list for like, yeah, well, like probably forever. a couple of years. Like when did it go public? 2020. So probably yeah. since 2020. So like yeah. since 2020 probably. Yeah. But I mean, probably the, one of the most, one of the main reasons I think I like Airbnb is because we use it. And a we've lot. used it a lot. And part of the reason we used it is because we have a large family, which I think most of our viewers know. And hotels were just not doable like you couldn't do a hotel with five kids we have to get two rooms all the time we, we always needed two rooms and then they'd and often they had to be adjoined because when we had little well kids, i was just gonna say they'd often put us in non-adjoining rooms so then we'll, often we'll, different floors right so what do you do <laughs> and we have to split up and <laughs> yeah that's not a very fun vacation <laughs> yeah. and i think there was a recent airbnb commercial that was just brilliant they talked about different mm -hmm. bedtimes, mm -hmm. right? Like, do you really want to go to bed at the same time as your kids? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, we didn't mm -hmm. want to go to bed at the same time as our kids, but we were stuck in, even if we could find a room, we'd end up in a, in a all squashed into this small room. And you know, when 9.30 goes around and the, the babies have to go to bed, and the baby has to go right. to bed, then we have to go to bed. And right. that wasn't much fun. And also even like, there was a time we went to, uh, we went to a wedding mm -hmm. and it was a large group of friends and we split the hotel with my brother and his wife. Yeah. And even that, like, it was fine because like we get along, but they had one bed, we had the other. I think we had one or two babies at that time. They mm -hmm. slept on, I think we had two, they slept on the floor yep. in between. But even that, like getting ready for the wedding, you and my brother were in the wedding party. Yeah. And like my sister-in-law and myself were trying to get ready and you guys were trying to get ready and we're sharing a bathroom There's one and washroom. the kids were like... One of the babies was crying and there's one washroom and then a it bunch a of our friends kept coming in and out and we were like, it was a disaster. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, Airbnb travel for us has just been a real blessing, if you want to call it that. Yeah. It's just been nice. Yeah. I, myself and a couple of my oldest boys just went on a ski vacation actually mm -hmm. and we didn't want to have to pay for food every day that we were there in, in terms of restaurants. Um, and so and we you just didn't even want to go out after a day on the no, mountain. We, you're we, tired. You yeah, we, we stayed back. more or less slope side, pretty close to slope side. Mm -hmm. And after a day of snowboarding, you were just cooked. So yeah. I didn't really want to find exactly. a restaurant at that point. So we bought groceries and we cooked in the unit, which was, which was great. Even us, like we went to Florida not long ago and we were looking at hotels cause you were at conference. So we were going to stay at the conference hotel, which mm -hmm. I mean, is a little convenient for you because it's. Close. Just roll out of bed. Or are we going to stay off site and at, and at an Airbnb? And we actually still chose an Airbnb when it was just over you and Disney I Resort. over the Disney Resort mm -hmm. because it wasn't even price. It was just like we didn't want to be bound to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Like so, in the evening, you're sitting on your bed. Then you go to bed. Like yeah. your bedroom is your living room. Your bedroom is your kitchen. Your the, dining room. Like, your dining room table. Yeah, and we also like to have two bathrooms, which is a totally different thing. But we like to have two bathrooms, and hotels sure. yeah. generally don't have that. Yeah. yeah. Well, also the Airbnb unit we rented actually was a lower price than the hotel, the conference hotel, and it had a private pool. Right. It did have the pool. I so, which it was, was really nice mm -hmm. for us in that. Yeah. Scenario. So there's just a lot of reasons, even if you don't have a big family i think the only time i would choose a hotel is if i was traveling by myself or but, i mean the two of us sometimes we we like to stay in a hotel if it's occasionally close to if it's close to conference that's why. but even then i'll make some concessions mm -hmm. if you can find an airbnb mm -hmm. that's nice enough around the area yeah. overall we are a fan of airbnbs and what they bring to the travel market for us as travelers mm -hmm. we've found them to be uh, overall a very good experience mm -hmm. i don't think we've ever had a really bad experience in an Airbnb nope. going through a trusted host. So nope. from that standpoint, we've had very good experiences. Yeah. And so that made us look into the stock. Mm -hmm. And then also recently, and this is partly why we haven't done a video in 
a month or two, mm, yes. we actually purchased a cabin. Mm -hmm. uh, and That we intend to do short-term rentals. That with. we intend to do short-term rentals. We're just kind of fixing it up a little bit here and there and we are going to rent it and we've been floating the idea around like do we place it on airbnb mm -hmm. or do we just like there's already people interested in renting it so we just kind of go through word of mouth yes so we were talking about that and we were looking into airbnb there's a lot of advantage mm -hmm. as a host to put on airbnb but we can't speak yet if it's good or not because we haven't actually placed it that's there. right that's right i mean we'll d dive into that in a few yeah. minutes what is the advantage of a host or even a renter prospectively mm -hmm to go out via Airbnb versus other platforms mm -hmm. like Facebook Marketplace. Because that's really one of the things that we're looking at doing now. Do we do we list on Facebook Marketplace? Do we just go by word of mouth or do we go by Airbnb? So I think before we get going into our little shallow dive, I'll give a brief history. Sure, go for it. Okay, so Airbnb started in 2008. Mm -hmm. It was started essentially by two guys who they really, well, it was 2008 and yeah. they needed to make rent. Yep. And they couldn't make rent and they're like, how are we going to make rent? Right. So there was a design conference going on in their city and they decided because it was such a huge design conference that they were going to rent out air mattresses in their, in their place mm -hmm. and then take that money and, and pay, the rent pay their rent. rent. And they were going to rent them out to people who wanted to go to this conference but couldn't find a hotel room. So they advertised it as air bed and breakfast because hmm. it's an air mattress. Okay. So hence air B and B. Sure, that's and that's where the, the name came from. Right. So they realized like how successful this was, and so then they decided, well, why don't we like start like finding other people to rent out their rooms? So mm. it started as just people renting it. Like if you and I had a room, yeah. as our kids get older, they move out. We would rent out our spare room to someone, and they had a friend who designed all the all the tech stuff. Sure. And Airbnb was born, so it was kind of born out of adversity. What was interesting to me though is that Verbo has been around since 1995. They were not the first people to have this idea, but they have killed it and really put Verbo in the background. In our first rental that we ever did, yes. via short-term rental in 2010, mm -hmm. I remember this one, that, that's the first time we ever did something like this. Mm -hmm. We rented in 2010 and we rented uh, we rented via Ver Verbo. Yeah, of so, course. At that time, it was called vacation. Vacation rental by owner. Yeah, yeah. So and it wasn't on a phone. It was on the desktop. Yeah, <laughs> and it, and it was a little bit disconcerting because we were going to go there for three weeks, and you would, mm -hmm. you would, you're always kind of a little bit more tech forward in this respect, and you would book this thing, and we go down there, not sure what to expect. Yeah, and that was back before when you had to um, remember we had to drive to this box. At, oh, yeah. at, the, at the managing office, but yeah. it was late because we didn't even get into Florida until it was like midnight. midnight yep. We had all the kids in the back. We only had four kids at that time, but one was a baby. Yeah. And we were tired because we've been driving for three days. And then we're like looking for this like little mailbox. We yes. couldn't find it. We're like, right, did we just get like scammed? And then we had to go and get the key. And then we had to like drive to the place. Yeah. Now it's so easy. Just go to the place. Just go to the place. Like so you usually a lockbox or, exactly. or like some so sort of easy. smart lock there. It's really come a long way. But yes, Verbo started in 1995 and so I actually wanted to know I was like how on earth did like Airbnb beat the pants off mm -hmm. Verbo and that's a great question actually yeah and there was a couple of reasons that I this is just my opinion but I think is the reason uh, vacation rental by owner eventually got acquired by home away mm -hmm. and then from there they got acquired as we know now by Expedia, Expedia yeah. right and so they don't have the fire of the founders Yes, Airbnb there is something to that. still has the fire of the founders. Okay, yeah. we'll call it that. Then, when you look at the R&D, hmm. Airbnb has just put way more money, uh, way more research and development money into Airbnb. And I really, I think for me, that is the key difference between Verbo and Airbnb. And you can see it in their, I mean, now Verbo, Verbo rebranded re, uh, in 2019, I think. It's better mm. now, like the app is better, things are better, but for a long time, like it just wasn't even worth using Verbo because they just sucked that bad. Yes. And then the other reason is, and and you, they mentioned this, one of the, the bigger reasons too is that Airbnb wasn't only vacation spots. Okay. Verbo was only vacation spots. So you're thinking places like Hawaii, uh, Flor like Orlando, Florida, yeah. maybe the Keys. Right. Um, I don't know, wherever other wherever people go to yeah. visit on vacation. Sure. Whereas Airbnb was everywhere. So they hit this way larger market, particularly urban areas. Okay. And that just really also helped them to just 
get a bigger network because right. people are like, oh, I used it when I when I went to visit my mom here, right. or I used it when I had a conference there, and all of a sudden, like word of mouth, and it was just a bigger a bigger network of people using it. And honestly, Airbnb has become part of the common vernacular, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, no one says I'm going to get a verbo. No one says I'm going to get a verbo, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever. And also, you know, when I'm homoid. booking vacations, I go on the Airbnb site first all the time. Yeah, and you Verbo look. sits there in my travel folder yep. on my phone. I don't ever open it. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what the structural advantages of Airbnb are. I think mm-hmm. from, I think we've talked a little bit about that from a renter's perspective, mm-hmm. right? So one of the things, again, and you touched on this briefly, that as a renter going on vacation, I want to make sure my vacation is going to be seamless. Mm-hmm. Right. With a hotel, I know that if I go to a Marriott, I'm going to have really no problems checking in. Although we've had had problems checking into hotels in the past where they've literally given away our rooms. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because we don't always get places early just because of the where we live. Our flights are oh, we never have direct flights. Yeah. So even if we have to be at the airport at 3 a.m., yeah. we do not arrive at our destination until 10 p.m. Then yeah. you have to get a car and you have to drive to the hotel. And yeah. On and well, and there's one recent booking. I booked a hotel wherein they they gave away the room and they yeah. essentially told me, they said, oh, we was don't that have, Rochester? that was, they said, we don't have room for you. And I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. And then I told them I already paid for it. And then that changed their tune completely, at which point they comped us the presidential suite. Yeah. Then we got the best suite at the hotel for <laughs> but, no extra cost. For no extra cost. But yeah. the point being is if I hadn't prepaid for it, we would have had to find another place to stay, mm-hmm. which was crazy. Mm-hmm. So as a, it's a very airline-ish thing to do, very much so. But as a traveler, I want to make sure my experience is going to be fairly seamless. Mm-hmm. And so usually or traditionally with a hotel, that was the case. Now with Airbnb, I would argue and say that if you get a high ranked host, there's a pretty good likelihood mm-hmm. if I find a host who's you know one of these super hosts mm-hmm. or whatever you want to call it, um, who's an experienced host, has lots of ratings, mm-hmm. lots of good reviews, there's a good chance my stay is going to be pretty good. Right. And right? Airbnb works to do that. They do. Exactly. It's a you, network. It is it's, a network. It's got that network moat to it, yeah. as we like to talk about. There's that network moat. Mm-hmm. So whereas if we look on Marketplace, you know, and rent mm-hmm. from, you know, some random person, yeah. at that point, we don't know what we're getting Which is our conundrum. Do we just put it up on Kijiji, Marketplace, exactly. word of mouth? Yeah. But then people are more a little more hesitant because they don't know us. Yes. They don't. We don't have the backing of Airbnb. Airbnb takes rentals down. Yes. If it's not reliable to what they said it was or if the host is bad. And they've taken it. I think they have about 5 million hosts and listings and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they've taken down recently, they said in their most recent um, earnings, took it down 200,000 of them. Yeah, that's a lot. So that's a lot. So they really want... They're taking it serious. They are. And they what they want is for their users to know, oh, I can book on Airbnb and I'm going to get exactly what this person says I'm going to get. Yeah. That's right. The photos are going to be actually what is representative of the property. You know, the the, the person's not going to have issues checking in and checking out. They're not going to get gouged, which yeah. is one of the complaints that I've heard mm-hmm. as of recent. The chores. The chores, but also <laughs> just gouging. I've heard that's been a bit of an issue. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Airbnb let, being left a little bit on the, we'll say, dirty side, although some people say they maybe just forgotten to take out the trash and were charged, you know, a $200, yeah. you know, cleaning fee. To take out one trash bag, I mean that's a little right. unreasonable. Yeah, that is. Unreasonable. So, but anyway, they've they've worked to make sure that that part of things is a little bit more seamless. Yeah. In terms of uh, other things, I'd be looking for as a renter. I'm looking for value. So mm-hmm. from that standpoint, if I can make sure that my stay is seamless and I can find decent value for what I'm paying, that's really what I'm looking for as mm-hmm. as a traveler. Mm-hmm. So on the flip side, as a host, what would draw us? as new property owners in this respect who are prospectively doing mm-hmm. short-term rentals, what would draw us to that platform as opposed to, you know, Facebook Marketplace, who's not going to take a percentage right. of our yeah. of our bookings? Do you know what the biggest thing for me is? Mm. Reviews on who's renting it. Right. That's, that's I would the say biggest so thing because if you are renting, and I've talked to someone who owns short-term rentals, yep. and they said it's easy to know if you want, they don't take any instant bookings. Mm, okay. They they don't do that because you don't know who they want to kind of vet who they're getting. Sure. And they said like you know you'll see something where it says customer might be more appropriate for a hotel and everyone kind of knows what that means. It's a nice way of saying like yeah just don't rent to this person. Don't rent to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or girl. But you know if you have the if if I can see that other hosts have said oh yeah like 
good tenant or whatever, easy to deal with, pleasant. It's that peer review process. Paid promptly, like, yeah. left it clean, right. didn't damage our unit. Right. That kind of thing. So that's one one thing. That's the main thing. The that other peer review process. Yeah, one hundred percent. That would be the main reason why I would put it on Airbnb because right now we've kind of rented to friends or friends of friends yes. or family of friends. And so we know them, it's fine. It's like good. There's, we, there's great rent. Very there. little risk there. But we have a lot of vacancy. Of course. Right? Yeah. So we want to fill that vacancy, but it's like I don't want to just fill it like like and I'm I'm gonna I don't wanna fill it, you know, and have like fifty guys show up from a bachelor party. Right. <laughs> I just like that's not who I want to rent it yeah. to. And you don't know who you're renting it to a marketplace because they could be like, Oh yeah, like you know, it's just me and me and my wife showing up because they could say whatever they want. We're not on site. Well, I didn't notice, be, but until I went and booked the Airbnb personally, but there's actually a, a reasonable vetting process right, up front. Right, because Whistler was your first. That's right. I always do the You bookings. always did the booking. So Whistler was your first. So I actually okay, had yeah. to go and create an account and not right. knowing that process, I didn't realize, and maybe some of you other guys out there who might be listening, your wives book all your holidays <laughs> too. But the point being is, I didn't realize, but there's a fair amount of vetting that goes on up front. You have to mm -hmm. submit your driver's license and some other documentation, create an account. All this has to be mm -hmm. verified, etc. And then you contact the property owner who will essentially look into you. And yep. the property owner for us asked me why I was going, what was I doing there, and a few mm -hmm. other things. So I was That's going... interesting because I have never been asked. No, or maybe I, it's because you have no reviews. You had a new account. I had no reviews. Yeah, so I've never ever been asked by a property owner anything. So from that standpoint, there's that vetting process yet mm -hmm. again, which you wouldn't get off of Facebook Marketplace yeah. or you know any other sort of mm -hmm. uh, platform. I can't speak to Verbo or HomeAway or mm -hmm. any of the other platforms. Oh, I'm assuming that I just I would never even their website. Oh, it's, it's just, just like ridiculous. Horrible, yeah. I would assume it's a very similar process, yeah. but again, I'm I'm not yeah. sure. But the the whole point being is that platform itself lends itself to security on the property owner's mm -hmm. perspective. You it's social that, proof. It's social proof it's social and a network proof. mode. And right? it matters. It matters. And it really matters. And so me as a host, that is the biggest thing that I'm like, oh, do I really want to be placing my property up on Marketplace? Mm -hmm. Also on the renter side of things, the other thing you'd be looking for is selection. So mm -hmm. oftentimes you and I, when we go somewhere, we have a specific vicinity we want to stay. Mm -hmm. So not only do we want to stay in you know, Florida, we want to stay in, you know, me like close to the theme parks and things like that so we're gonna be very selective and I mean there's not it's not difficult to find somewhere close to theme parks right. in that perspective but you want to have inventory mm -hmm. and you want to have selection for people who are gonna be particular with where they want to stay and mm -hmm. that's one of those other moats I think that Airbnb mm -hmm. has yeah because you can put they have a lot of listing. In, right? for me like I like that too because there are certain things that are important for our family like we want a pool we want a hot tub we want a heated pool yes <laughs> I want like two or three bathrooms. I want four bedrooms. Like I'm very specific sure. about where. Well, I and stay. and doing something like that on you know Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace you or can. Craigslist it's or whatever, good. you you'd spend hours and hours yeah. just looking for a place. And right. I mean, once you found one, if you wanted to rent it consistently, fine. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's going to be a hurdle for you. Yeah. So let's move on to why it's going through an event. Yes. Like why is it trading at 52 week lows if it's so right. wonderful? Yeah, if it's so great, <laughs> if it's so great, if it's such a boat, <laughs> why is why are people dumping their shares? Yeah, and so okay, so the main reason is because they're going just through a regulatory nightmare right now yeah. because a lot of places and districts and cities are just trying and people are just trying to shut them down. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. There's a few reasons behind that. Uh, one is that. The main one is that they feel that Airbnb is responsible for making housing Expensive. not affordable. And there's just the whole supply and demand because everything's a short term rental. And so the regulators are coming in and saying, like, we want to bring our housing down. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't mention all the things they've been doing over the past 20, 30 years yeah. that have also muddled Inflated. with the housing. But Airbnb yeah, makes houses. a very beautiful scapegoat for that. That's true. I read it. I came across a a quotation from an article recently, I guess someone from a business school did a research study on how much Airbnb actually inflates property mm -hmm. values and whatnot. And I think they said that it accounted for like a 1% increase mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact numbers. But politicians will never ever, and, and this is all politicians, 
Like, I, I don't really care uh, what party you run in. Oh, yeah, of course. It's every single politician. Um, they will never take responsibility. No, of course and not. And so we all know that There's they're... There's a perfectly good scapegoat. Yeah, like, why would why you would take you? it on your back? And you need votes. Like, that would be, right? It's yeah. political suicide. I think a lot of the populace, too, views Airbnb in a negative light in a sense that if you live next to an Airbnb, maybe you've had some negative experiences. I'll say this from... I, I read a someone who is harping on it. And, uh, if you want to take a truly balanced approach, you have to, you yeah, have to listen right, to people, right? right? Yeah. So this person said, well, I bought this, you know, mistake number one, I bought this home, you know, or it was, I think, a condominium or a flat mm-hmm. or something like that next to an Airbnb. So it was, okay. it was very, like, they, right. they basically adjoined, right? right? And so they said, oh, well, the Airbnb people often, you know, are noisy and they don't know how to check in and they don't know how to check out and they don't know how to take the garbage out and you know things like which this which probably is true which is probably true and i mean maybe a source of annoyance but this person knowingly bought a unit next to an airbnb so yeah. i mean from that standpoint it's like come on yeah I, I mean but having said that though i think there is this sense that people do find airbnbs do attract a certain maybe noisier populace which if you're on vacation because you're on vacation so exactly. you don't have a schedule you're not Correct. getting up for work you're on vacation. Like, we have a very different schedule when we are on vacation than we do when we're at home. Yeah. I like to think we're not terribly noisy when we're on vacation. But at the same time, I could see if you're getting up regularly for work and whatnot mm-hmm. and your neighbors, you know, are up till 2 a.m. And, mm-hmm. you know, having fun right. because they're on vacation, how that could get annoying. Another study that I came across had said something to the tune of only 1% of Airbnbs, or sorry, only 1% of residences are actually... Airbnbs or Airbnb eligible, basically. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say eligible insofar as could be done with it, like in terms of regulation, but only 1% of residences are actually uses Airbnbs or less. Oh, okay. So oh, it's small. small. It's like one in a hundred. Yeah. So it's a very small percentage. If you go back to what I said before about there being 5 million listings mm-hmm. on Airbnb, I mean, there's a significant room for growth there that's, mm-hmm. that's still there. But, but on the flip side, that means that there's really not a lot of them. Yeah. Well, and also they have like five main countries. Which yes. are like Canada, America, Australia, France, and the UK. I think so. I just recently uh, read the transcript of a, it was like a tech um, conference mm-hmm. and the CFO for Airbnb was there and they answered a lot of questions and they were just saying like that was one of the things they said they really want to tap in to outside of those five main countries. So Makes like, sense. You think about how many countries there are, that's a lot of growth for them. No now, question. this regulatory thing is an issue. Oh, no question. And here's the thing, too, about this regulation. I know I, I said, like, politicians are going to blame someone outside of themselves. That's, I mean, tell us all this time. But uh, home prices are also a very hot topic right now. Very much so. Right? It's so a hot button issue. It's a hot button issue, yeah. like home prices. Like, everything you read in the States, it's like, oh, home prices in Canada. It's home prices. Every mm. politician is promising, like, everyone deserves More good. supply, et cetera. Like, right? Mm. It's just, it's a very hot topic right now, right? Sometimes, like, there was a time when the opioid crisis was a hot topic, and then the pharma companies were like, oh, the, you know, I'm not saying these things shouldn't be hot topics, or, sure. right, there's probably reasons why they're hot topics, but when a hot topic comes along, there's always going to be companies that are going to be the scapegoat for yeah. the politicians to say, oh, it's their fault that this happened. Well, and honestly, what's easier? Is it easier to introduce regulation to ban Airbnb, or is it easier to build 10,000 new homes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of course, it's easier to ban yeah. Airbnb. Yeah, a, a stroke and then, of a pen versus yeah. years in the making. Yeah. So one of the one of the negative things for Airbnb is I think it's called Local Law 18 in New York. Sure. And that was just a sweeping regulation. Yeah. That you were no longer to do short term rentals, and it was just like boom, done, and the short term rentals sort of yeah. down. And I think now you have to be in. It on premise you can still do a short-term rental but i think you must like be living there so you could I, for us for instance we could rent out our home as an airbnb but the basement right but and, and i think it's to only so many people sure it's very stringent so pretty much it's going back to what airbnb originally was but what has happened with that because hawaii also has a, had a very uh like blanket regulation a little different there because you can still do a short-term rental in the very highly tourist so like waikiki yep. uh Turtle Beach. Turtle Beach. All or is it Turtle Bay or Turtle Beach? We stayed there. Can't remember what it's called. One of the two. One of the two. You can still do a short-term rental there, but no longer in residential areas. However, what you are seeing 
on the Airbnb side if you're seeing long-term rentals go up. Of course, yeah. So that's their fastest growing market, I think, right. is you know kind of medium to longer-term rentals. Yeah. And there's a validity and that's to that as well. Of regulation. So it's not only for vacation rentals. So when we think Airbnb, you and I think Air, we think vacation rentals, but. Yeah. You know, if you're a business traveler who's going to be somewhere mm-hmm. for six weeks, you know, staying in a hotel for six weeks might kind of suck. I guess my point is there's still a market there. Oh, 100%. Right? So from that standpoint, you just attract different travelers. So mm-hmm. from that perspective, if the limit is 90 days in Hawaii, you certainly will find people who are 100%. willing to rent for 90 days and go stay in a nice place in Hawaii. The world has gotten smaller. Of course. And uh, even you and I, like back in the day, you met your spouse where, I don't know, work, you church, worked. school, yeah. right? That's where you met, and then they lived within the local vicinity. Yeah. Right now, you meet your spouse across the ocean. Might be online. Might, right? You, you like, might still work together, but it might working. be virtually. Like you, you work in your at your office, you drive home. You can, now you could work there sometime, and then you could, you, you could work in a different province for, like you said, six weeks, eight weeks. Yeah. And so we know several people now. We know one guy in particular whose fiance was living out of province. So yep. he was like, well, screw this. I don't want to stay this far away. Yep. And he rented a long-term Airbnb so yep. he could be close to her. And then we recently talked to a friend who got a contract for a job out mm-hmm. in Ottawa. Yep. And he needs to rent a long-term Airbnb for That's his right. guys to go and do the work. So the world is smaller, yep. which opens up a very yep. big market for Airbnb long-term rentals. Yeah. So I think there's regulation there. I think the point we're trying to make is regulation is a risk factor. A big risk factor. It is a big risk factor. I don't want to downplay that. Mm -hmm. It is a fairly large risk factor. And it's a risk factor that will probably escalate. So from that standpoint, I think it's something to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. I I think it's going to be overdone. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a pendulum swing that's going to be overdone. Airbnb is already fighting with New York to, to keep the local law 18 in, but to change it. Yeah. And I think someone, I read an article that summarized it well. They said, yes, we need some regulation, but to have blanket regulation for all areas doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah, that for sure. And I, I tend to agree with Matt that. Why would you use the same regulation in you know New York City as you would for a small cabin country mm-hmm. where the cabins are, mm-hmm. you know. Hawaii did it okay. Sure. I, I thought Hawaii, when I read about Hawaii's regulation, I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense how they did it. I mean... It, from the, the, and maybe I'm being a little selfish in this respect, but because we are looking at doing an Airbnb rental. But to me, it seems that if you have an area, so let's use Squamish, BC. Right. It's apparently beautiful there, but I've never been. Mm-hmm. Okay. But apparently it's, it's just gorgeous there. Mm-hmm. But the real estate is difficult to get. So how can someone like us mm-hmm. enjoy that area mm-hmm. other than to someone graciously rent out their house? Then at the same time, the flip side would be like, if we had a house there and we owned it, we might get really annoyed sure. if there was different people. So like, you're ne- it's kind of like a boss employee. Yeah. You're never go- a boss and employee are never going to see completely eye to completely eye to eye. If even if the boss is super great, or even if the pl- employee is wonderful, there's always going to be like a little friction, yeah. and you just have to work with that friction in the best way possible for both parties. Exactly. And I think that's kind of how Airbnb is. Yeah. You're never going to have a perfect relationship there between like the people who own the homes and yes. then the people who are renting, and then the renters. And there's a lot of people involved, and people make everything messy. Of course. So some regulation, I guess, in a sense, may be welcomed, mm-hmm. to a point anyway. I think Airbnb wants some regulation because they don't want to be shut down either, which is why if you're it, a bad renter, they're going to leave those reviews up because what course. they want is good renters going into these short-term rentals so that the neighbors and the people around aren't complaining. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, their, their yeah. platform keeps running. That's right. So they are, they're going to work really hard too to make sure that it is as seamless as possible for everyone involved because they don't want to... They don't want to, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's right. Yeah. I think that's one of the main reasons that Airbnb is experiencing, you know, a significant downward pressure. The other reason I think is because of a few analyst downgrades yeah. have Which, come across. And they've come across because. Because of the regulation. Mm-hmm. But also a third point is the macro environment. So before People we... are, ex- are experiencing and expressing some concerns mm-hmm. about the macro. Yeah. People kind of. are just more poor. Yeah, people are more poor and they assume that people are going to be tightening up the wallets. Regulation can really kill a company. No question. Like 100%. Like, and it's something that companies have very little control over. Yeah. But a lot of times, uh, 
journalists and investors and analysts look at regulation coming in and panic. So what what kind of situation do you do you think this is a stay away situation or do you think this is a oh wow this might actually give us a good opportunity to jump in? I think as I mentioned before there's probably going to be more downward pressure yet mm-hmm. to come. I think the regulation's going to keep coming because as you mentioned it's a good scapegoat. I'm reading more and more about cities that are doing it. I think as this plays out I think there's going to be more downward pressure on the stock because I think there's going to be a momentum gain there. Mm-hmm. However, on the flip side I think as the New York experience has been, they're going to find that it didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, they didn't improve housing prices Mm -hmm. at all. And not only that, the local authorities collected less tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So that's the flip side to this. As you are regulating Airbnb and as these politicians and authorities are looking to regulate that, they're also cutting off the source of tourist income, which is substantial in many places. So from that perspective, I think this is probably going to be a short-term event. However, I could see the momentum carrying on for a little while. Right. I think at to a certain degree, there may be a little bit more downward pressure on the mm-hmm. stock. That's just my guess. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my... Okay. As I mentioned, there is recognition on mm-hmm. policymakers' behalf that there is industry there, and mm-hmm. this actually will suppress businesses. Yeah. So even though the the locals might not like it to a point, there will be some that do because it is generating local revenue. And I think as you know, business and jobs start to dry mm-hmm. up because of regulation. If they are successful mm-hmm. in certainly curtailing the amount of tourism and stuff like that in these these areas. I think they'll feel it in their wallets and that will probably reverse course. That would be my guess. Yeah. It's always so funny when you talk to people, to residents, because we talked to a guy, a friend of ours, and he was saying they had an Airbnb. Right. uh, Like five doors down. Yes. And he said, oh yeah, like it wasn't really a problem, but we just didn't like, like there were different cars. That's pretty good. That was a big thing. There were different cars in the driveway all the time. Sure. And so we had to like shut that down. And, and, and I kind of chuckled because I know his family uses Airbnb. Yes. So I was like, so you want to use it and you like the advantages <laughs> of it, but how dare you put an Airbnb right. on my street? Not in my neighborhood. <laughs> and then his reason too was like, oh, safety. And I was like, safety for what? Like you could, you could have like, who knows who your neighbor, who knows the real story of the neighbors, exactly. right? Because I mean, like you always hear about like those drug busts and then the neighbors are like, oh, they were the nicest people ever. Yeah, so it's it, like, safety's a concern whether they're long-term or short-term, it, it whatever. Doesn't. But I just thought it was so funny because I was like, isn't that the human way? Like, I want to use it. Yeah. But you can. In someone else's neighborhood. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, oh, that's just like the most human sentence that I've heard yeah. in a long time. Yeah. We digress there, but let's go back to the macro because that's another reason that's putting downward pressure on Airbnb right now. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll be honest, the macro environment doesn't look fantastic, at least in Canada. So they're talking about, you know, rate cuts and I've heard someone talk about jumbo rate cuts, whatever that is. Whatever a jumbo rate rate card is. (laughs) I really like, I I love the headlines that journalists come up with. Jumbo. I I think it's maybe over 0.25 basis points. Next day it'll be like, mega jumbo rate cuts (laughs) coming again. Mammoth rate cuts (laughs) coming. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, so you got to add these adjectives in front of everything, right? Of course. So so clickbait. So the the macro environment doesn't look great. I mean, central banks have been reducing... Mm -hmm their interest rates people are poor like we feel it i shouldn't say like we're not poor but no no people are have less money people have less money and it's palpable did. i think yeah. is the concern and i think there's going to be what's the first thing you you stop doing when you have less money well you don't travel right i mean the first thing to go is not food it's not yeah. water it's not it's your travel plan so interesting point on that when i read that transcript the cfo said one thing they're seeing that's different and this is why i love airbnb because they really have so much data. Oh, data yes. is power and yeah. they have so much. And they will have a lot. So they said they used to see people plan a vacation and I was yes. like, wow, like this is uh, like, this is literally us right now, like six or seven or eight months, months in advance. Mm-hmm. Now they're seeing like, it's not that people are booking less vacations instead of booking your Thanksgiving vacation in let's say, you know, May or June. You're booking your Thanksgiving weekend. Okay, this is Canadian Thanksgiving in October. Yeah. You're booking it in September. Sure. Right? Or instead of booking your Christmas vacation in September, you're booking it in November. Yep. And I get that because we're doing that more because it's like the money is a little like tighter, tighter mm-hmm. now. Expenses are a lot higher. So it's like you don't 
know for sure where you're going to even be in six months. That's so like, you don't want to lock up that money. You don't for want to six lock months. the money up. Yeah. And so yeah. I get it. And I was like, wow, like just the fact that they can even see that and look into it and they're, they acknowledge like, oh yeah, like this is happening, but we're not concerned because what we're seeing is that the time between travel is just less. And yes. It's very interesting because like they have so much data at their fingertips. Part of that as well was probably also pent up COVID demand. So that was part of that as well. Mm -hmm. I think there is merit to that um, argument that people are still traveling. It's just they're booking maybe yeah. six weeks in advance instead of six months. Yes. The other thing that would go contrary to the whole macro idea, I suppose, is the fact that analysts are expecting the revenue to increase by 11% over the next four years annually. Yeah, that's weird. So, and then they're saying, oh, but yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's assuming current conditions and whatnot so i mean let's be honest if the market and the economy does take a downturn then travel plans probably will be mm -hmm. curtailed some mm -hmm. some i would imagine i think it will just change i think instead of people going on huge extravagant vacations they'll go to a more local vacation so whether which or not actually it may not be bad for Airbnb. right i was going to say because like even in our province if you don't want to go to hawaii because now you're paying for the airfare yeah. and Hawaii is just expensive. Yep. You know, you can book a cabin at one of the beach, the cabin countries. That's right. There's lots of places that do do rentals. That's a lot cheaper. And we're actually, we are seeing that, that a lot of families we know are, are starting to do that a little bit more. That won't hurt Airbnb. No. So to that point, oftentimes the accommodations, even when you stay local, aren't necessarily cheaper than the destination. Mm -hmm. It's just that you factor out all the other travel yes. expenses i.e. airlines, gas, oh, actually, like some that. of the cabins I looked at, and I'm just going to say, like, they weren't that nice. Yeah. It looks like no one's done a renovation in them since the 1970s. Sure. They were more expensive. Than, than... somewhere we'd stay <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> elsewhere, exactly. Yeah, oh, I know. It's... But you're saving on so many other things. But you're saving on other fronts. So mm -hmm. you can afford that maybe extra expense. Yeah. And then, in, in turn, that actually turns out to be a wash for Airbnb if someone like us is still... Mm -hmm maybe traveling local through mm -hmm. Airbnb as opposed to mm -hmm. Hawaii through Airbnb. Exactly. So for them, it's a wash. Right. Let's get to the numbers because we've been yip yapping away for a long we've time. We've been talking. But it's been so fun to do this research into Airbnb and I'm not even close to done. Like we're just scratching the surface here. Of course, yeah. But we are loving that it is dropping. Yes. And like this bad news and it being a Bring on the bad news. Like bring on the regulation. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. So we assumed, uh, I ran a quick back of the napkin valuation on Airbnb. So at present, Airbnb is trading at about 17 times free cash flow. Mm -hmm. So which is actually at its historic low. So they're cash flow positive. They're generating strong cash flow, at least over the past two, three which years. Which we like. Which we like, even more than earnings, honestly. Yeah, and earnings is an accounting illusion. That's right. <laughs> it's magic. That's right. <laughs> Jeff Bezos was a very adamant proponent of free cash flow yeah. when with Amazon. And so is the CFO of Airbnb. That right. was one of the things they kept saying, cash flow, cash flow in that in that Q&A. And I was like, I love that. Never earnings. Yeah. Because we all know earnings. You earnings are an illusion. Earnings are an illusion. So if you look at uh, Airbnb, they're trading at 17 times cash flow, which if you kind of flip that over on its head, that's about a 5.8% free cash flow yield mm -hmm. on, on this stock, which you could say, well, given the risk-free rate of, you know, four and a half percent isn't a huge buffer of safety it's still better for now for now but once that mega super rate, rate cut, cut comes happens. in exactly then that free cash flow of 5.8 percent is looking pretty good right <laughs> exactly but also though if that you know in a year from now if that free cash flow goes from being six dollars and 81 cents a share which it has been over the past 12 months to you know 10 percent is six seven dollars and you know 50 cents mm -hmm. You know, that, now that pushes the price upwards, right? right? So from that standpoint, it makes sense because you may get the whole Davis double play exactly. that, from that perspective. So if... And we love the Davis double play. We do. So if you... That's the free cash flow. Now, if you look at earnings, if you take $4.42, I think is the number I used uh, as my input, mm -hmm. and you grow that at a 11% growth rate over the next Which four years. Which is the analyst. And I only used four years. I didn't use much longer because I, I thought, well, let's, let's keep it tight. You get to a terminal value at that point of uh, $167, give or take, okay. for a share price of Air Airbnb in four years' time. And if you factor that back at a 12% discount rate, then you get a present value of about $106. Okay, I thought you used a 15% discount rate. 
That was in my previous one. Oh, that was in your previous <laughs> one. So you were a little more. I was a little lenient. bit more lenient. This you time. okay? Because I'm always a twelve percent discount rate. And yeah, you yeah. Generally stick to the fifteen yeah, percent yeah, yeah. discount rate. Yeah, yeah. yeah, usually. Yeah, so we use a fifteen percent discount rate. We both used to use that because yeah. we were we learned how to be value investors. But I massaged it to twelve because I don't invest in crappy companies. So sure. I thought I could. You can punish that. them a little less. Exactly. Yeah. So from that standpoint, you get to a. A fair value of roughly $106 a yeah. share. And so of course, like, there's some assumptions there. And so it's trading not far off of that. There are assumptions in every valuation. Of course, yeah. Every valuation has assumptions. So even when you're like reading online, like you have, that's why you have to do your own homework. And I think the best way to do it, honestly, is to come to a range of values. And so my range is somewhere from 96. On the low end. On the low end, the high end at like 150 something. There's no way I'd buy it 150 something. No, no. Like that, that, that ruins your margin of safety. That ruins my margin of safety. And like that was just being way too lenient. But it's always fun to like look like, oh, like yeah. if I only give it like a 10%, if I only punish it with a 10% discount rate and yeah. I say it's going to grow at this percent, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, and that's always the difficulty in predicting the future. Mm -hmm. So traditional, and this is one of the things I've learned in the more recent past, the traditional value investor would look for value that's present. Mm. They look for value that's there. They look for hidden assets. They look for property that was maybe not in the books for what it should be. Mm -hmm. And like so, rail companies. so for rail, for instance, so you, you know, the rail company was trading at a hundred million dollars, but had, you know, $500 million of assets that were just not really accounted for or just buried in the balance sheet somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you bought that, you know, hundred million dollars of assets and you had bought, literally a dollar for 20 cents exactly so that was traditional value investing but now with a company like airbnb there's not really hard assets right and that's the difficulty now you have to factor in what are the earnings going to be like mm -hmm. for airbnb in four to five years yeah. are they going to be more probably how much more that's the million dollar yeah. question and there's a book that we both read called where the money is yeah. i think it's called and it calls it value investing 3.0 yeah and so there was value investing what you're talking about where you're buying like Hard assets. Hard assets. And, and then there was value investing 2.0, which he would say is what Warren and Charlie did. Yeah. Wonderful companies at a fair price. And then he talks about value 3.0, where you're investing in tech companies like Uber and Amazon. And he actually talks about like why he adds the R&D back in. Sure. And just a quick side note, because we're talking about Airbnb, have very big R&D compared mm -hmm. to Verbo. Yes. If you look back in the early days. Which well, is probably why they squashed them. <laughs> exactly. And so that's value investing 3.0. I think that's... Pretty much our discussion for today. We've we've gone a little over time. I don't know if you have anything else to add as a summary. Oh man, there's so much more I want to say. Like I'm thinking through my notes, going like, oh, talk about the CEO, talk about this. I will say that all three founders are still involved. That's very to important. Extent, to an extent, and so I was really happy to see that. It's their baby. They did this. They want to see it keep growing they don't want it to get regulated away yeah right they they want to make this legacy yeah and so i like that i like that too and oftentimes founder ceos there's just something there's a je ne sais quoi he's a french yeah. term but yeah. there's a je ne sais quoi about them i don't know what it is they maybe it's they're building a legacy maybe they just care for the business more i think they just get they're it there more. for the they get it more they're there for the long term they're not just there for the paycheck and mm -hmm. you know to leave the private jet, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, they get all that too. But the, but the idea is... But they built it. There's something about built building it. something from nothing and yeah. then nurturing it and yeah. watching it. It's like, it's like a child. Right. Like you're excited <clears throat> to watch this thing grow. You don't want yes. it to die. So anyways, do you have anything else to say? I don't. Yeah, I have lots more to say, but we don't have time. <laughs> That's fair enough. Okay, so we're going to leave it there. If you can like and subscribe, that would be great. And thanks for watching.